Okay, so for people, you know, presumably trick away, they usually seem to, but let's get started. So we ended yesterday on a frustrating note. I was trying to find a Taylor series and I could not think, I was, I thought, doing that. And I, um, but when I went to Desmos and, and graphed the first few terms of the Taylor series, they weren't doing their job. I mean, knock wood, but if I remember what I did yesterday, I also know what I did wrong. So the Taylor coefficients, as they're called, we take the nth derivative of A over N factorial, then we've got X minus A to the N. And I am so used to finding Taylor series that are centered around zero. I think what I did yesterday was I forgot that minus a term because if it's centered around zero, that minus a term won't be there. So knock wood, but I think if we now find this Taylor series again, it will do what it's supposed to do. And also we were kind of cramped and rushed finding the Taylor series yesterday. So let's, um, let's not be so rushed today. There isn't any rush. We won't do the next section until next week, but this is an important enough section that I don't feel bad spending three days on it. So let's take this just piece by piece. N starts at zero. We need the zeroth derivative and the zeroth derivative is just the original function. Then we stick the center in. So here the center is one. We stick the center in and we get the coefficient. The natural log of one is zero. Finally, we're going to take that, we're going to divide it by n factorial. This will just go away. Zero is, is um, zero divided by anything is zero. But let's write it down anyway. And let's build our Taylor series in Desmos as we go. So apologies for having my back to do, but this is easier if I can see the screen. So we've got zero over zero factorial times x minus zero to the zeroth power. And we've got the natural log of x and we've got this point, um, one comma zero. We're interested in the natural log of x at one. So we're interested in what happens near this point. N equals one. 
the first derivative is one over X. We stick X equals one here. We'll get positive one. So over here, we'll have sort of cramping together again. We'll have one over one factorial times X minus one to the first power. And let's take a look. Plus one over one factorial X minus one to the first, there we go. I don't know if you remember what we were seeing yesterday, but as I said, I'd forgotten this minus one. So I was getting the right shape of the curve. I was getting the line I wanted, but it wasn't in the right place. N equals two, F double prime is, okay, X to the negative first, negative one over X squared. We stick one in here, we get negative one. So minus one over two factorial X minus one squared, which, hmm. Well, we can go to Desmos and we can quickly see, is this making our approximation better? So minus one over two factorial X minus one squared. And in spite of that ambivalent hooming sound you heard, this certainly does seem good. I mean, if we center in at one, then this polynomial is doing a fine job of approximating the natural logarithm. So keep going until I either see a pattern or decide I'm not going to see a pattern. Um, so negative one, let me use this for scratch work. Negative one over X squared is negative X to the negative second. So we take the derivative of this, this negative sign and this negative sign will cancel and we'll get two X to the negative third. Uh, stick X equals one in here, we get two. Um, so, Two over three factorial times X minus one cubed. And again, it looks good. 
Uh, we might have to be satisfied with It Looks Good. This is a Taylor series I never memorized, and there isn't an obvious pattern showing up so far. But, I mean, of course, the beauty of the Taylor series is, I mean, if you're interested in values, near the center. So if you're interested in values near one, who cares if a pattern showing up? We only needed three terms. If you need so many terms that you need to look for a pattern, probably you should put your center somewhere else. <laughs> Still, we can, let's go. N equals four, five, six. I think at that point, We'll have given this problem as much time as is appropriate. So n equals four, the fourth derivative. We've got two x to the negative third. So that's negative three. Um, well, it's negative six x to the negative fourth. I think if there is a pattern, I think it might involve factorials. This negative three coming down will give us a three factorial, three times two times one. And this negative four coming down will give us a positive four factorial. And this negative five coming down will give us a negative five factorial. And we've got these x's. Okay, but every time we stick x in here, x raised to any power is one. So when we stick x in there, we just get the factorial. So negative three factorial, positive four factorial, negative five factorial. These are our coefficients and let's see, two is two factorial, one, is one factorial, wait, two, yeah, that's right, two times one, one is one factorial, uh, this is, one is zero factorial, And our pattern breaks down here, but fortunately, this is just zero. So we don't need to include it. And I guess it doesn't really matter if our pattern breaks down. So minus three factorial, over four factorial x minus one to the fourth. Three factorial over four factorial x minus one to the fourth. 
beautiful. So next it should be plus four factorial over five factorial x minus one to the fifth. Great, this is good. And let me, um, if we need like six or seven or 10 terms, we've, uh, we've centered our Taylor series around the wrong point probably. Let's see if this, this should simplify. Three factorial is three times two factorial. That should cancel this two factorial up here and leave us with just a one third. Four factorial is four times three factorial. The three factorial is cancel and leave us with a one fourth. Likewise, this is going to be one fifth. So our next term, negative one sixth, x minus one to the sixth. That looks right, that looks good. Going back, let's see. Yeah, one over two factorial. So this pattern holds, I mean, one half, one third, one fourth, one fifth, one sixth. And one over one factorial is one over one. The pattern does break here. We cannot have one over zero. But again, the fortunate thing is that this zero term isn't anything. It's, I mean, it's zero. We can remove it and we're not changing anything. So this is the Taylor series of the natural log. And um, what's, I mean, if we just look at this, what if we want to know what happens around 40? Yeah. I mean, abstractly, my answer to that is, if we want to know what's happening around 40, we shouldn't be centering our series at one, we should be centering it at 40. But putting aside that real world answer, plus one seventh, here, let me, let me copy you are the power of technology. Let me be x minus one to the seventh minus one eighth x minus one to the eighth plus one ninth x minus one to the ninth. I mean, all of these polynomials was that we're seeing, however many terms I'm using, they look like they're doing a good job around here near this point, but it doesn't look like this interval is spreading out the way that it did with e to the x and um, the cosine of x. It looks like we basically just have this smallish interval, it's in, that's now in the way. It looks like we just have this smallish interval around here where our approximation is good and our approximation isn't getting better around 20 or 40 or 60. <clears throat> the more terms we add. And this is a matter of the radius of convergence. So let's see. 
it's natural log. Is it at zero? Well, we'll find out. Um, this natural log, this is a distraction. Let me get rid of it. I mean, it's obviously, I shouldn't say that, but this is help to this. I hope this is something you know. The natural log is not defined when X is negative. So, I mean, clearly this polynomial is defined when X is negative. And no matter how many terms we add, this polynomial over where X is negative cannot be approximating the natural log. The natural log isn't defined. And over here, the natural log is defined, but no matter how many terms we add, we're not causing the polynomial to look like the natural log. And this is because I already said kind of the magical phrase, but this Taylor series doesn't converge everywhere. It's only converging on an interval near the center, near one. So if the series isn't converging, if the series is infinite, then of course an infinite quantity can't approximate a finite quantity. Let's, um, what did we come up with? Uh, if we want to find the radius of convergence, we are going to want to try to write this series in generality, because we're going to use the ratio test. And to use the ratio test, we need to know what a sub n plus one is, and we need to know what a sub n is. So let's go here. So starting with, hmm, or starting with n equals one, our pattern broke when we had zero. We've got an alternating series. We know from our alternating series section that that's going to be negative one to a power. Um, the problem with negative one to the n is that all of our terms will be off. So negative one to the first power would give us a negative one. Then negative one to the second power would give us a positive one. Then negative one to the third power would give us a negative one. So this is why, I mean, if we haven't sort of talked about it. This is why in the alternating series sections, you kept seeing, you know, n plus ones in the power or n minus ones in the power. That's going to cause our signs to be accurate. We start at one, one plus one is two, negative one squared is positive. Our first term will be positive. And then our terms will alternate. So let me, so two over three factorial, that's one, third and one over two factorial that was one half and 
three over four factorial, that was one fourth. So we can maybe see the pattern one over one, one over two, one over three, one over four, and so on. Um, in particular, when n is one, you know, it's one over one. When n is two, it's one over two. When n is three, it's one over three and so forth. So whatever n is, we've got one over n. When n is four, we have one over four. And then we've got x minus one to the n. And if we want to use the ratio test to look at the ratio, sorry, to look at the radius of convergence, well, we've used the ratio test many times now. It's Hopefully, attaining the status of an old friend, although maybe that's too much to hope for. There's a sub n plus one. And here's a sub n. And let's look at our terms together and let's algebraically simplify this. And I'm going to, because it is hopefully an old friend and we're used to how this works, these negative ones are going to go away because they're in an absolute value, right? So I'm not going to bother simplifying those, I'm just going to ignore them. Then we've got one over n plus one divided by one over n. So n over n plus one. Then we've got x minus one to the n plus one. x minus one to the n. And the n is going to infinity. X plus one, X minus one, sorry, is just staying put. Uh, I am getting sloppy as, as it gets nice out and uh, the semester rolls to an end for taking this limit. So what happens here? Well, we can use Lobatow's rule if we don't see this as an obvious thing, that the fraction is going to one. And we end up with the absolute value of x minus one. This converges then if the absolute value of x minus one is less than one. My algebra students hate 
this, but it's something we need to be able to do when you're using the ratio test. Rewrite a um, absolute value inequality as a duo inequality like this. So this Taylor series only converges on the interval from zero to two. And that, of course, has implications. I mean, when we were looking at um, the cosine and when we were looking at e to the x, and I was like, well, the sort of the Taylor series everyone memorizes or the McFerrin series, their series centered at zero, and the series, this does converge everywhere. And I mean, my advice is that if you want to know what happens near 50, you use 50 as your center. I don't think you should use the Taylor series centered at zero and then have 500 terms or however much it takes. But Ultimately, the cosine series and the exponential series do converge everywhere. If you wanted to know what happened at 50, you could center at zero and then just laboriously add dozens and dozens and dozens of terms, and the interval will get wider and wider, and eventually you will be a, get a good approximation at 50. And I mean, that does not happen with the natural logarithm. This series only is only finite. It's only converging. between a zero and two. It's only converging here. So if you want to know what the natural log is doing at 10, you cannot use this series. It's no longer a strong recommendation. If you want to use the Taylor series, um, to approximate the natural log around 10, you have to change this center so that it's at 10. This uh, brings us, let's look. So we can approximate the natural log on this interval. Notice that even though, I mean, this is a massive Taylor series, as a general rule of thumb, I don't think I've ever seen anyone use a Taylor series with more than four terms in it. So using all of these terms is massive. Still not the great approximation around two, is it? Um, I mean, around one, it's great. If I zoom in, I mean, if I if you're red and colorblind, or if I make both of these blue, there is literally no way to look at this and tell the difference. That is no longer the case at two. These are now clearly different functions, and I mean. This is, I'm zoomed in, but this is like here. This is about 0.7. This is about 0.8. So, I mean, there's an error in the first decimal place. It's a pretty big error. And that's just, I mean, that's because, let me now alter those. That's because of how Taylor series work. They're super accurate at the center, and the further away from the center they are, the less accurate they get. 
And that's why when we were doing the ratio test, I said, okay, we have this interval and the series might converge at the end points. It might not converge at the end points. I really don't care whether it converges at the end points or not. And I was disagreeing with the textbook there. The textbook's like, oh, you must check what happens at the end points. But I mean, using, we don't want to add more terms. I mean, this is already an enormous Taylor series. So the question of, well, if I added 500 more terms, would this approximation become good at two? I don't care. If I want to know what happens near two, I'd put the center closer to two. I wouldn't add a billion more terms and then worry whether the Taylor series converges or not. So because we take it for granted that the Taylor series shouldn't be used far away from the center, the question of, but does the Taylor series converge or not far away from the center just gets a shrug from me. I don't care because I don't want to use this Taylor series around two. Well, that was, uh, I guess from one point of view, 40 minutes to do a single Taylor series, but we also talked about other important stuff, like that conversation we just had about the radius of convergence and not using Taylor series far away from the center. That was an important talk to have. And I'm, I guess I should say I'm sort of monologue at you, so an important talk to give more than have. We have about 10, per, uh, 10 minutes left. Well, we really have more than 10 minutes left. I said, that we should look at the sign at some point. Why don't you start this off? Why don't you find the first two terms of the Taylor? series centered around zero. Let me do the first two terms just so you can check your work and then we'll give the rest of them. So remember that we start with the zero. It didn't matter with um, the natural log because um, the, 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 the zero term was zero and it's not going to matter here. The zero derivative is the original function and the sine of zero is zero. So we're going to start with a term that doesn't do anything. Zero over zero factorial times. So, well, let me write this in. Times x minus zero 
to the zeroth power. But of course, x minus zero doesn't do anything, so we don't ordinarily bother writing that, which is why I, I ran into that trouble with the natural log, because I'm so used to not bothering to write the subtraction that when we needed it, I forgot it. N equals one, the derivative of the sine is the cosine. The cosine of zero is one. So that will be a non-zero term. And we can keep going, but this is so similar to the cosine, which you already have in your notes. And we're coming up to the end of class, and I can just, the sine of x is like the cosine of x, except we're keeping different terms. The cosine of x, we kept the, 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 the even term, so we had a zero term, a two term, a four term, and so on. Here we're keeping the odd terms. X to the first minus X cubed over three factorial plus X to the fifth over five factorial. And so on. And just as with just as with the cosine and just as with the um, exponential function, this converges everywhere. Okay, we have a few minutes left. There's an important statement about Taylor series that I didn't make that I am going to uh, make now. You can compose Taylor series naturally. Statements like this are always risky because what's natural to one person might not be natural to another. But I mean, the sine and the cosine and e to the x, those are functions we can do a count to this with. I mean, we can take their derivatives. I guess it's sort of abstractly nice to replace the sine with a small polynomial. It certainly might make some problems easier. But The great power of the Taylor series is that they let us deal with compositions that U substitution, for example, won't let us deal with. If we want the sign of E to the X, now it's E to the X plus E to the X cubed over three factorial plus e to the x to the fifth over three factorial. Uh, missing some, there we are, missing some minus signs, I was about to say. Minus e to the x to the seventh over seven factorial and so on. 
And we can rewrite this e to the x to the third. That's e to the three x. And e to the x to the fifth. That's e to the five x. And e to the x to the seventh. That's e to the seven x. And now u substitution would be helpless. None of the techniques we've learned would work to take this integral. But because this is a Taylor series, we can just take its integral piece by piece. E to the x, the integral of e to the x is e to the x minus one over three factorial times one third times e to the three x. That's the integral of this. Thus, one over, gosh, it's just my day for, well, more like just my minute. I made two goofy typos in the same problem. So the integral of this, we've got one over five factorial times one fifth e to the x. The integral of this, We've got one over seven factorial times one seventh times e to the seven x. I appear to be going for a world record here. Put that five in. And here's our approximation of the integral. And you might say, okay, but, but it's just, I mean, but working with infinite series is hard, right? I mean, it's, it's not a good thing if our answer is an infinite series. So, I mean, you can say, well, we took the integral, but now we have this horrible infinite series and that's bad. Except we know in practice, well, yeah, Taylor series might be infinite, but we can just take the first few terms of them and get really accurate approximations around the center of the Taylor series. So, if you're interested in what happens around zero, if you're working near zero, you don't need infinite terms. If you're working near zero, you need maybe the first three terms. And thus we're able to get a very good approximation of this integral. Again, the downside, or downside's not the right word, but the trade-off is that we do need to be working near the center of the Taylor series to do this. So if we're interested in an integral, for example, if we're interested in a definite integral like this, we can do this. We have a very good approximation of the integral. These values are very close to the center. This will be a very good approximation of the definite integral. If instead of going from zero to point one, we were going from, from 10 to 11, then we'd have to reassess because 10 and 11 are not near the center. This is probably not a good approximation. 
And I'm looking ahead a little. The next section is applications of the Taylor series. And we'll keep going with, um, well, with several important applications, but especially with integrals, we'll keep talking about this next week. And I will uh, we'll see you then.